animal my soul, bird my by, return me back to the cigarettes or something. <laughs> So welcome back, or welcome, if this is your first time here. I'm Abby, and Vinyl Monday is usually the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. But it is December, it is a Friday, which means this is the third and final part of Double Album December. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do one minute versions of all of my videos here on my channel, over on my Instagram, and on TikTok. This is the third and final double album December of the year, the third Vinyl Monday Redux, and my last album review of 2023. I know, I'm sad too. But do not worry, there will be more next year. Last but most certainly not least, the final double album December is... Blonde on Blonde by Bob Dylan. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what the next album is gonna be. I host polls. I make announcements when I'm places that aren't here. You can find all that on my channel. So why am I redoing this now? I don't think there's a better way to end the first annual double album December than with rock and roll's first double album. I first covered this one 13 months ago. In that time, my skills as a writer and content creator have vastly improved, gotten bigger shelves, I've learned how to edit, and the format of the videos have changed. Not to mention my hair and makeup is way better now, and I found the jacket- and I found the jacket I lost! I feel this album deserves a more fitting evaluation, and I hope I can do it justice this time around. Alright, for the last time of 2023, turned over because I always forget how this goes. Let's take the plastic off. So my copy is, um, well, I have three. This was my first, my MoFi box set edition. My dad got this for me for Christmas a few years back. It plays at 45 RPM. I don't play this one very much because it's honestly kind of a hassle to change out the record so much. This is a triple album on 45, but it's a wonderful keepsake item. I'll be showing you this booklet in the B-roll along with all of the art on all my other Blonde on Blondes. There's a lot of art to look at. This is my second copy, a US stereo. This is my beater copy. I honestly don't play this one very much because all of side four, the grooves worn completely down. Smooth. Smooth. My third and most special copy is the one we're going to be seeing the most of today. A UK mono from 1966 in beautiful condition. This was sent to my P.O. box by one of you viewers. A very generous gift. I honestly couldn't believe it when I opened the box up. I don't know if you've noticed, but the past three weeks of Vinyl Mondays and Double Album Decembers have all been stuff that was sent to my P.O. box. They were all from you, the viewers. You really do make these videos happen. Thank you. So on to the cover art. We have a little more to talk about in this chapter of the video than we normally do. The cover was photographed by the iconic Jerry Schatzberg, one of my favorite photographers of the 60s. I love all of his work with Dylan. You can tell he was really comfortable with Jerry, and when you're comfortable with the photographer, you get some great shots like this. There was a clean version of this shot, but Dylan liked the blurry one better. He thought it captured the energy of the music. No, it's not a reference to the weeds or the Sid. Quite simply, it was winter in New York City and it was brick. Really, really cold. Dylan didn't care though. He never wore warm coats because they weren't stylish enough for him. Total fashion victim. That's why he had on this little tan jacket and gave Susie Rotolo his big green parka for the cover of Free Wheelin', thus birthing the Bob Dylan coat meme. It's January in New York. The sun was going down. Both subject and photographer were shivering thus blurry photo. Speaking of Dylan's clothes, this is the first of three album covers in a row where he's wearing this same suede jacket. Here, 
John Wesley Harding in 67, and Nashville Skyline in 69. Most call Blonde on Blonde the end of Dylan's golden trio. I call it the beginning of his jacket trio. Apparently it had a little puke on it. Charming. Opening up the gatefold this way, you get the full version of the shot, but when you open it up this way, that's where it gets interesting. This is my UK copy from 1966 with nine photos on the inside. So Jerry had this photo of actress Claudia Cardinale in his portfolio. It was included here in the original Blonde on Blonde gatefold, sort of to credit Jerry as the one who took all these photos. However, it appeared here without Claudia's permission. So all runs after the original will either have eight photos or, like this US copy, seven instead of nine. If seven was nine... Yeah, it just doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? On Blonde on Blonde, we of course have Bob Dylan on vocals, guitar, harmonica, piano, and our principal songwriter. He's backed by a constantly rotating cast of characters, including but not limited to Al Cooper on organ, Jerry Kennedy and Wayne Moss on guitar, Harry Sterzalecki on bass, Pig Robbins on piano and keys, Charlie McCoy on all of the above, plus trumpet, Kenneth Buttrey on drums, and Wayne Butler playing the trombone on Rainy Day Women. Dropping in on the New York sessions, we have Paul Griffin on piano and Bob Bobby Gregg on drums, and our special guests include Rick Danko and Robbie Robertson of The Hawks, soon to be known as The Band. Rick dropped by the New York sessions while Robbie worked with him in Nashville. Blonde on Blonde was produced by Bob Johnston. Roll transition. So from 1965 through 66, Dylan is arguably at the zenith of his career. He'd have other peaks like Blood on the Tracks, but uh, uh, picture Bob Dylan in your head, right? Some of you will see this, or this, maybe even this, but most of us will see this. Right now, he has maybe the most influence he will ever have. He's a rock star and living the rock star life. Through bringing it all back home and Highway 61, Dylan has fully gone electric and royally pissed off the audience and organizers of the 65 Newport Folk Festival in doing so. Apparently there was a, supposed to be a movie about this where Timothy Chalamet was cast as Dylan, but I haven't heard anything about this since 2019 anyway. While yes, Dylan was one of the most popular and influential musicians in the world right now, he had the Beatles going folk to keep Keep up with him. He's also hated by the community he popularized, so we have this weird dichotomy going on right now. He's selling out the auditorium, but getting booed at every single show. Joan Baez said he changed, and she wasn't wrong. For the Highway 61 tour, per recommendation of John Hammond Jr. after they played on his record, Dylan reached out to Levon and the Hawks. They were based out of Toronto, set to be Sonny Boy Williamson's backing band, but then he fucking died. In September of 65, about a month after Highway 61's release, Dylan and the Hawks get together in Toronto to jam. They find they're just about the perfect fit. They trek out to Columbia's facilities in New York to record their first single together, Positively 4th Street. Right now, Dylan is living at this place called the Chelsea Hotel. Hotel. Nowadays, it's like this swanky hotel apartment kind of deal that you have to pay a fortune to stay at. But back in the 60s, it was an artist's haven. Dylan was partying with his neighbors day and night, hanging with troops of artists, musicians, and poets. Occasionally in a taxi with John Lennon, but his escapades mostly overlapped with Andy Warhol, his factory, and his superstars. Specifically one of his neighbors at the Chelsea, model, dancer, actress, and troubled heiress Edie Sedgwick. She was war 
Warhol's favorite in 65 and may have inspired Just Like a Woman. There's also a serious case to be made for her inspiring leopard skin pillbox hat. She was known for romping around the city in her signature leopard print coat. It's unclear exactly how well they knew each other. Accounts range from mere acquaintances to the Factory Girl film. At the very least, Dylan knew of her. She was a fascinating woman, so it's not hard to picture him being inspired by her in one sense or another, regardless of if they had a thing or not. Initial sessions for Blonde on Blonde take place from October of 65 to January of 66 at Columbia Studios in New York. These sessions coincide perfectly with two very big changes in Dylan's personal life. In November, in November of 65, Dylan married his first wife, Sarah. He'd adopt her child from her first marriage. Then, in January of 66, Sarah gives birth to her second child and Dylan's first. I don't know if it was the stress from a new marriage and babies or simply from being Bob Dylan in 1965, but these sessions in New York just weren't working out. Only one song from those sessions made it onto the final album. Sooner or later, one of us must know. Per the recommendation of Bob Johnston, Dylan rounds up production and moves it down to Nashville. That was Johnston's home base. He had a lot of connections down there. Where Absolutely tonight, Sweet, Sweet Marie, Marie was the first song completed for the album. You can hear the first take on Bootlegs Volume 12. It's amazing to me how fully formed this song was going in. You can tell Dylan and his musicians were all very well rehearsed, and that's because they just been touring before this. With Sweet Marie, they were really able to set the tone for what Blonde on Blonde was gonna be. The Nashville sessions went way smoother. These took place from February to March of 66 at Columbia Studio B. A big part of Blonde on Blonde is the keys. There's piano or organ on almost every single song, quite a few with both. Enter the simultaneous MVP and rookie of Highway 61, Al Cooper. Through the Blonde on Blonde Nashville sessions, the guys quickly establish a routine. Bob would write the lyrics and the outline of a song, then hand it off to Al so he could arrange all the other parts. Then Al would teach every session player their part, Dylan would come back in, and Johnston would record the whole thing. Nine times out of ten, it worked like a dream. Or rather, 13 out of 14. When it came time to record Bob's wedding gift to Sarah, sad-eyed lady of the lowlands, this thing just went on and on. The players all built up to what they thought was gonna be the climax, and then it went on for another seven minutes. The thing about Dylan is, whether he likes it or not, He's the life of the party. When Dylan isn't happy, no one is happy. See the New York sessions. The vibe in Nashville was a lot lighter, so things got a little silly. Plus, recording would go really, really late into the night. This was the case for the last day of recording, where they cut half the album in one marathon 12-hour session. Late night delirium, plus Dylan and co shooting the sh** and a little reefer, I'm sure, gave us our opening track, Rainy Day Women 12 and 35. I'm not the best at math, but I'm told if you multiply these two numbers, you get the funny weed number. Dylan wanted the Salvation Army band to play, but this was way too short notice to get them, so instead, they got local trombone player Wayne Butler in for that slide. The last song completed for the album was I Want You. The whole thing was mixed in April before Dylan went back out on tour. And just like that, they had an album. More than just one album. The Nashville sessions were so productive that they had enough material for two. So Blonde on Blonde became a double album. So why is it called Blonde on Blonde? It could be a reference to Brecht on Brecht, or White Square on White, or just Bob's name, B.O.B. -B. Bob. It could be a shout to Brian Jones and his girlfriend at the time, Anita Pallenberg, both had matching blonde Bob haircuts, uh, or Warhol superstars Edie Sedgwick and Nico both blondes. As compelling as those ideas are, I personally believe the title is a reference to the two guitars Dylan used to record this one, both blonde wood. The track listing of Blonde on Blonde goes as follows. Opening 
up disc one, we have Rainy Day Women numbers 12 and 35, followed by Pledging My Time. Then Visions of Joanna, and closing out side one, we have One of Us Must Know. Opening up side two, we have I Want You, followed by Stuck Inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again. Then Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat, and Disc 1 closes with Just Like a Woman. Opening up Disc 2, we have Most Likely You Go Your Way and I Go Mine, then Temporary Like Achilles. Next, Absolutely Sweet Marie, then Fourth Time Around, and ending Side C, Obviously Five Believers. Closing out the album, on the D side, we have Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands. Blonde on Blonde was released on June 20th, 1966. For a long time, the exact release date was unknown because get this, no one bothered to write it down. The more I learn about 60s rock and roll, the general sense of people forgetting to write these things down becomes less and less surprising. But once it was figured out, Blonde on Blonde was determined to be the first double album in rock and roll history. He beat Zappa to it by exactly a week. The promo single was sooner or later One of Us Must Know with Rainy Day Women and I Want You to Follow in the summer. A handful of songs were recorded for the album but didn't make the cut, most notably I'll Keep It With Mine. Dylan wrote it in 64-ish and handed it off to Judy Collins to record first in 65. Warhol Superstar, his new favorite after he ditched Edie, and Velvet Underground associate Nico released her version in 67. Blonde on Blonde had a world tour to support the album both ahead of and following its release this material was arguably at its very best live like on Bootlegs Volume 4. Recorded at the Manchester Free Trade Hall on May 17th, 1966. I'm wandering off course for a moment here to say that it wasn't Blonde on Blonde or any studio album that got me into Dylan's music. It was this live album. I know I'm gonna overuse a few of these words in my review, but the atmosphere of this show was magical. You can feel the tension in the room between those hanging on to his every word, and those rejecting Dylan's new direction. Sometimes those two groups were one and the same. The second half is rambunctious, bordering on hostile, leopard skin pillbox hat, ballad of a thin man, and like a rolling stone especially are openly hostile. But the first half was the magic that drew me in. Just a man and his guitar, his voice worn thin, you can imagine his clothes are too, spinning these fantastical images with his words, this intimacy, this vulnerability and gravelly warmth he possessed in this moment made me fall head over heels for him. The Manchester show also happened to bear one of the most infamous moments in all of rock and roll history. <laughs> I don't believe you. That moment right there and Dylan's response was the inflection point of 66 Dylan. Blatant refusal, him at his most defiant. Dylan kept trucking on for a while after the Judas show, living very fast too fast. Until December, where he crashed his motorcycle in Woodstock. Only three people ever really knew what happened that day. Dylan, his wife Sarah, and his manager at the time, Albert Grossman. Al and Sarah have both passed, and Dylan's not saying shit. After whatever happened that day, we will never know the full story, Dylan went on a hiatus of sorts. Leopard skin pillbox hat was thrown out as a single to tide the fans over, but he'd otherwise benched himself for the summer of love. To the general public, Dylan's golden run came to an abrupt end. He disappeared. People had questions, rumors flew, someone faked a hospital bedside interview. Though the New York Blonde on Blonde sessions were a bust, he linked back up with the Hawks again out in Woodstock while he was recuperating from the crash. These sessions, more so just a casual hangout, would become 
the basement tapes. When Dylan finally did resurface, things were drastically different. Psychedelia had largely come and gone in the time Dylan was out of commission, so Blonde on Blonde is really the closest we have to a Dylan psych album. Overall, Blonde on Blonde's legacy cannot be overstated. So many other acts did double albums after this. So many have covered these songs. This was one of Will Miller's suitcase albums in Almost Famous. Even fucking Death Grips has a song named after a line in Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat. So, for the last time in 2023, what do I think? <laughs> I know I've been doing themed transitions for these albums, but I couldn't let this year go without just one more Circle Sky. Anyway, going in. This is my favorite Dylan album. It came into my life at just the right time when everything felt so precarious. I lived this album. In my junior year of college, I lived in a tiny apartment with six other people. When I say tiny, I mean tiny. Our kitchen was so small that we had to brew coffee on the floor in the corner of the living room. I brought about a hundred records and my full stereo system with me into my seven foot by nine foot bedroom. Uh, and Blonde on Blonde was one of them. All our friends were our neighbors, and all our neighbors were our friends. We were wholly forgotten by Campus PD, so we could do literally whatever we wanted without getting caught. And we took full advantage of that. We partied 24-7. It was a pretty unstable time in my life, honestly until our motorcycle crash moment, March of 2020. It took me years to figure out exactly what the Thin Wild Mercury sound was, and this is my best guess. It's a perfect balance between the romantic and the topsy-turvy. Swirling feather-light acoustic guitars with a sparser use of electric, driving and sturdy but not too prominent rhythm section, and a damn good use of piano and organ. Mobile and Sweet Marie are standout moments. Sooner or later has an interplay between piano and organ that is so memorable. Once I realized just how important the keys were to this album, I experienced like a paradigm shift. Like, that's the it! For this reason, Al Cooper is the MVP of Blonde on Blonde, not just for his contributions on organ, but for arranging nearly the entire album. He's the reason it all sounds so good, and I think that's the reason none of Dylan's subsequent records quite hit the same. No others have the same delicate, intricately layered production. The standout moments are Visions of Joanna and Fourth Time Around. As for Bob yeah. singing, because people love to say he can't sing, number one, He's never off key, he just doesn't care to hit the notes he should. Because too, Bob has perfected what I like to call his impressionistic singing on this album, where he picks a note, just kinda throws his voice up there, and hope it sticks. If it doesn't, who cares? And number three, on my third listen through, around the time of Mobile, I realize just how tired Dylan sounds. Not so much world-weary, just sleepy. Knowing how jam-packed his schedule was, how aggressively he toured, and how the Nashville sessions were mostly held at night, I'm not surprised we hear so much sleepy Dylan. Not to mention the baby waking him and Sarah up every night. While Dylan's voice may be thin at times, it really doesn't matter when you've got this incredible band and incredible body of work. This is some of the Bard's best songwriting. I've been listening to this for years, and only now am I noticing how beautifully these lyrics were crafted. Mobile was the one that got me this time around. You have these zany situations like crashing a wedding and hiding under the truck when the bride's dad chases you down, or a senile grandpa lighting a bonfire in the middle of the street. And then this cripplingly honest confession. 
Now people just get uglier and I have no sense of time. There's songs that fall in and out of favor with me as the years go by, You Go Your Way and Temporary Like Achilles aren't standouts for me personally. But if you ask me, there isn't a bad song on here. There's a cute observations made vague, masked by bizarre imagery like mules wearing binoculars on the chains of jewels, sweet moments cut by crass, tongue-in-cheek quips, the way I like to describe 66 Dylan is he's pulling you in with one hand and pushing you away with the other. The best example of this is sooner or later. There is just miscommunication after miscommunication happening between the couple in this song. Uh, miscommunication is a running theme on this album. Weird similarity to Rubber Soul. Maybe a better way to phrase it with Blonde on Blonde would be expectation versus reality. Love and relationships come up a lot. Lots of different kinds of love, from the longing in Joanna, the situationship of the century described on Sooner or Later, and the very flat out I want you. Then we have fourth time around, the you thought you were still in love with your ex, but now that you've seen them for closure, you realize just how much they sucked the entire time song. Lyrically, I'm pretty sure this song is about Dylan realizing he's in love with Sarah, while he's with someone else. Musically, I've heard this was inspired by Norwegian Wood, but I know for a fact Dylan accidentally wrote a guitar part too hard for him and was really frustrated doing so many takes of this repeated arpeggio, so he literally never played it this way again. There's some real laugh out loud moments on Blonde on Blonde, like I took his on I Want You, the deadpan observation of Grandpa Dad last week on Mobile, I didn't notice how young you were on Sooner or Later, horrible out of context, smoked my eyelids and punched my cigarette just about sent me into orbit, and of course, the hooting and hollering on everybody must get stoned. I get why rainy day women and pledging my time came first. That was to weed out anyone who wasn't ready for Dylan's new direction. It's like the circuits from hell. Rainy day women is the perfect example of unserious Dylan. The public will stone him no matter what he plays or doesn't play, no matter what he says or doesn't say. Then concluding, well, shit, guess I'll get stoned. I used to not like these songs, now I totally get them. Dylan wields a harmonica the way most rock stars wield their guitars. That's most apparent on Pledging My Time. It basically takes the place of a guitar solo. Though, my god, it is ear splittingly loud, or maybe I'm just getting old. I'm not sure why they decided to really send it on the mix. Production did something really cool, though. The harmonica pulls back before the rest of the song fades out, like you're walking through and away from it. Once you get through the big top freaks and absolutely demented harmonica solos, we get to one of the most beautiful songs in Dylan's whole catalog. Visions of Joanna is like stepping into Wonderland, a surreal, impossible night in New York City. It's all the most beautiful parts of bohemian living, hopping from station to station, party to party, lit by flashlights, because the blizzard knocked your power out. Like the nor'easter just did for me two days ago. You get all these vignettes from the same night, fishmongers loading their trucks and fat ladies sneezing, all of it only making our narrator more aware of the haunting, mythical Joanna's absence. The ghost of electricity howls in the bones of her face, and these visions of Joanna have now taken my place. Then one of the most honest lines in any Dylan song. Little boy lost, he takes himself so seriously. He brags of his misery, he likes to live dangerously. These are my favorite lines in the whole song, by the way. At surface level, it's how the public sees Dylan, but dig a little deeper and it's a rare moment where he's calling himself out. The million dollar question. Is Joanna supposed to be Joan Baez? As an onlooker from the distant future, all I will say is this. 
I will always wonder how things would have gone had Dylan not picked his career over the only woman who could ever really stand toe to toe with him. This was not an intentional short joke. Uh, Rainy Day Women Pledging My Time Joanna isn't an all time great three track run. Pledging My Time is maybe the weakest song on the album, but the sequencing was intentional. I love it when Dylan gets a little bitchy. He did it on his greatest hit and he did it on Leopard skin pillbox hat and just like a woman. Leopard skin is the most rock oriented musically. It really rolls on bootlegs four. Paired with ballad of a thin man, it is straight up menacing. With such pointed imagery as balances on your head, just like a mattress balances on a bottle of wine, you can't go wrong. Me with my belt wrapped around my head and you just sitting there says, I have to try to look like an idiot. You don't. You just are one. Damn! Uh, just like a woman is a tricky one. It's so sweet on the surface, like wedding procession organ and romantic guitars. But the lyrics are calling this woman emotionally stunted and weak. You want the song to be about you until you actually listen to it and then realize you really don't. Sweet Marie. My favorite recording will always be the one on bootlegs 12. Some of the longer songs like Mobile, uh, they can get a little tedious if you don't fully immerse yourself in the lyrics and the experience and hey wait this is only five minutes long this one is interesting it does all of the musical heavy lifting of a long song in two minutes less of runtime, jam sessions and everything. Obviously Five Believers has references to Rainy Day Women in the lyrics. I picture trying to hear your partner over the roar of a crowded dance hall, or the big finale of the Blonde on Blonde Circus Act sending all of us home. Finally, my very favorite Dylan song, Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands. This was the song that made me fall in love with Dylan. Literally, the first time I ever heard Blonde on Blonde was on a road trip in some random hotel room in Virginia in the middle of the night. This song came on and totally took me by surprise. I thought Dylan writing was supposed to be snarky and a little vague. I had no idea he was capable of this level of tenderness. Should I leave them at your gate or Sad-Eyed Lady should I, should I wait? This is a declaration of complete selfless love. I will wait for you forever if I have to. Another favorite lyric, from your silhouette where the sunlight dims into your eyes where the moonlight swims. In that moment, I realized this is what I want and it's entirely unattainable. I can never have the love that Bob and Sarah had because I'm not Bob and I'm not Sarah. These people already had this love. I actually choked on my tears as not to wake up my family. It was a life-changing moment for sure. I imagine Dylan staying up for days in the Chelsea Hotel, writing this 11 minute long epic for his new wife and son. Everything must have felt so precarious, like he was on a tightrope with people literally preying on his downfall and his new family was the net at the bottom. I feel as though Dylan was grateful for the pause to recuperate, both to establish his family and reevaluate his approach to music. If he kept going the way he was on here, he'd have had no voice left by 68. I love Bootlegs 4, but he sounded like sh**. Blonde on Blonde is impossible. A bit of a mirror really that such a mercurial guy could bottle up every single way he saw the world at this point in time. It's a miraculously consistent body of work with a rock solid band playing it and Dylan's writing at its most ephemeral, elusive. All in all, over 50 years later, it's still a wealth of stuff to pour over. I haven't changed this outro much because it's one of my favorites I've ever written. This body of work captured a wily, unstable, perfect time that couldn't have existed for long. It wasn't sustainable. But whether he meant to or not, he immortalized it. He took blurry photographs of his world with his words. A favorite suede jacket, 
Binoculars hanging from a strand of jewels, fishmongers loading up a truck, someone throwing glass in the street. Everything mundane becomes everything beautiful, and we don't know what we have until it's gone. Blonde on Blonde is that photo album, and we are so lucky to have it. Personal favorites. Oh my god, it's murder picking from this track listing. Um, Visions of Joanna, Sooner or Later, Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat, Just Like a Woman, Absolutely Sweet Marie, Fourth Time Around, and Sad-Eyed Lady. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all the Vinyl Mondays and Double Album Decembers, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it! That is Double Album December Part 3, my last album review of 2023, Blonde on Blonde. What a way to go out. What do you think of this album? What do you think of Bob Dylan? Leave a comment letting me know. I love to hear what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11, except for next one. Seeing as it's Christmas, I'll be on a break to spend time with my family. Thank <laughs> you.